Welcome everyone to a midweek episode of the Nordic Football Podcast here yeah, with myself, Steve Wiss, and Jonathan Faduba. Uh, not too often that we come out of the woodwork in right in the middle of the week, uh, my friend, but uh, of course, scheduling uh, times can vary. Uh, we're just recording this on the back end of a rather dramatic night of Champions League action um, in the qualifiers. How, how are you doing, Jonathan? Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. Yeah, this is um, just off the back of a hack and class bit game, of course. It's going to be, I think this is going to be quite a fiery discussion, if I'm being totally honest. Hacken, Beko Hacken knocked out of the Champions League tonight by a team from the Faroe Islands, Steve. Um, for those who want some context to this, is a massive shock. Uh, this guarantees that the first time in history a Faroese team will make the Champions League knockout stages. Oh, sorry, we'll make the European knockout stages their guaranteed Conference League football at least. Uh, obviously, they could get in the Champions League, they could get in the Europa League, but they've knocked out Swedish champions Beko uh Steve, you watched the game. I mean, basically, this episode is going to be a lot about the European matches, like a bit of reaction and a bit of uh, looking forward ahead of the next ties. But of course, we have to start with this massive news, Steve. I mean, Mulder have done their job, which we'll talk about in a second, but. Phew, Beko Hacken eliminated. You watched it. Tell us exactly what happened. Well, I tweeted after the game that I'm actually probably one of the few people disappointed that KI, the Faroe East champions, have gone through because for the second straight year, uh, the UEFA draw was very tasty looking. We looked like we were going to get Mulder against Hacken. Last year, we were going to get Malmo against Buda Glimt the two champions of Norway and Sweden against each other in the Champions League qualifying round, which, I I mean, I was really looking forward to it, I must say, Um, both years. And and twice now in a row, it is the Alsvenskan team who let the side down, if you want to call it that. Um, What an incredible game of football, I must say, this one. The first leg was nil-nil in the Faroe Islands, which wasn't a big shock. Um, We knew that was going to be a tight match and um, it's not an easy place to go. Uh, as for this fixture, um, KI took an early lead um, and then Hecken equalised. It was an absolute belter from uh, Tobias Sana. Um, and really, they dominated then, I felt. that They are in the ascendancy. They got an early goal in the second half from Le Uni. Um, immediately, KI equalised, though, five minutes later. And and then that what followed was an absolute mad period, I must say, from probably the last half an hour of of this fixture, not in regulation, no idea how another goal wasn't scored at either end. There was incredible drama right at the death when KI hit the crossbar in the 93rd minute. We go to extra time. Ibrahim Sadiq scores in the 105th minute. And you're thinking the game's done because KI did look a little bit on their feet. Then an own goal, a a goalkeeper own goal, 109th minute, KI get level. And then on on the penalties, uh, both teams did miss. Uh, but it was Hecken who missed twice. And uh, so a penalty shootout was a 5-3, sorry, a 4-3 win on penalties for KI, who um, a lot would, a lot of people probably would say they deserve to go through over the two legs. But, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I was disappointed because I wanted to see Hecken against Mulder, but, uh, you know, well done to uh, to KI. Yeah, and of course, we, as you just mentioned there, a bit of a spoiler, but uh, you should know by now, Mulder, of course, qualified. They managed to get through HJK Helsinki. So they did their, they held up their part of the bargain, despite obviously um, looking ropey at times themselves, but they made it through. So it will be classic against Mulder in the next qualifying round. Whoever wins that game will be one tie away from Champions League group stages. Am I right in saying that, Steve? Uh, we yes, could have absolutely a fair league team. true in the Champions League group stages at this stage, or potentially Mulder. I mean, whoever they, mm. whoever wins that tie is obviously going to have a difficult opponent, but, you know, we could have had Hack and Mulder for a place nearly in the Champions League. It's, it's devastating. I think as champions of Sweden as well, such an exciting team. Uh, I mean, Steve, you're going to ask me a few questions about Hacken in general, the context of it, but I mean, just to put this into context for listeners, the population of the Faroe Islands is 52,000 population of Gothenburg itself alone is 600,000. So the population of Klasvik is 5,000 5, people, Steve. So we're talking village We're talking village here, uh, and they've knocked out the champions of Sweden. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's crazy. I think it's a real massive shame for Swedish football, of course. Hacken has been described by the Gothenburg Post as a catastrophe. 
and I've already seen some comments coming from some of the players just saying they're in shock. Basically, they're in disbelief. Yeah, it's it's not a good not a good evening. I mean, Steve, you've got coefficients etc. like that. You're going to tell us a little bit about that, and then uh, I think you've got a few questions for me about how can in general like where do they go from here. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I... I don't want to take anything away from KI, but I think it's it's an embarrassment, to be honest, to get knocked out over two legs by a team from the Faroe Islands. Let's be honest here. So there's some players in, in the KI squad who they are literally part-time footballers, you know, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, things like that. <laughs> it's unbelievable. There's There's no... I might be harsh here, but I don't. There's no excuses for me. Uh, I think it's 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 terrible, and they were not even that unlucky either. Over the two legs, I think I actually think Ki were probably the better, slightly better team. In in the they've knocked, out, they've knocked out Ferenc Varos as well, so th- th- these are clearly no. They might be part time, but they're clearly no mugs. So you've got to give them credit as well. I think you do have to give them some credit. Um, in in 90 minutes in the second leg, according to Bet Three Six Five stats, incredibly they they actually outshot Hecken which is incredible. You would not have thought that. Um, In terms of the coefficient, I'm just looking at this list now. Sweden is now 23rd on this list that I'm looking at, um, below the likes of Cyprus, Israel, Greece, Croatia. Um, It's obviously a very disappointing, because Malmo reached the group stage of the Champions League, didn't they? Was it about three, four years ago now? Yeah, less than that, even less than that. Yeah, less than that. So it looked like things were going up. Your garden had a very good run in the conference league last year. But um, for the most part, I actually think it's been quite disappointing. The champions of Sweden the last two years have now been knocked out by Zalgiris, who were the Lithuanian champions. And obviously, KI now the Faroese champions. That is not good enough, in in my personal opinion, at all. and those are the sort of results that can seriously harm the coefficient of a nation over time if, if that keeps happening. Because you would expect the champions of Sweden to at least make this next round of Champions League qualifying. Um, you can't expect them to make the groups. You can't even expect them to have to make the, the playoff round. But to get knocked out now um, is, is obviously really poor. And uh, I think also, let's not forget the results last week for Swedish teams in the conference league. We don't know what's going to happen in second legs yet because we're recording on Wednesday night, but they were disappointing. You know, Kalmar lost at home to an Armenian team. Diff lost at home to Luzern. Um, Hammerby, we're going to talk about them later, but they they put up a fight, but you know, they lost uh, in addition. I, I miss worrying times for, for Swedish football in Europe, perhaps, um, Jonathan, but in terms of Hecken, does it surprise you that, I mean, you actually, to be fair, said that this might be a really close tie. Um, do you think the defensive deficiencies of Hecken ultimately are, are, are to blame you? Yeah, if you recall last week on the show, I said I think it'll be a tough, tough tie for them. Uh, I mean, you watch the game, so you'll be able to tell me more about classic style. You know, sounds like they're quite a... Um, I, think, I think with a lot of Scandinavian teams now, the level's gone up massively, whether it's Iceland, Faroe Islands... You know, um, wh- whichever parts of Scandinavia or the Nordic countries you want to talk about, really. I mean, the level in Sweden and Norway has gone up. And I think the level in, in other regions has gone up. You're definitely going to get an organised team. Uh, you're going to get teams that are quite defensively sound and and, and quite defensively minded. Obviously, the manager of um, EFK Otterborg now is managing the Faroe Islands, isn't it? We interviewed him on this show. And I think when you look at it, like he's obviously done well enough there to get a job in Sweden. So clearly there's de- decent managers there, decent coaches. Um, it's improving. It's a massive shock, and I, I definitely agree. It's, it's bad. I, th- I think, I think from Hacken's point of view, it's a massive. I mean, I've seen them getting laughed on Twitter. They were, they put a post out last week after the first leg, saying, "We'll be back next week to win the home leg." And I think that's definitely come back to bite them. Maybe it was a bit t- tongue in cheek, maybe, but you know these sort of things, Steve. They're always gonna when you're a bit cocky on social media accounts, is gonna come back to bite you. So. I've seen guys fans, I've seen EF Core fans tonight having a whale of a time on social media. Even AIK fans rubbing it in, like they're definitely being called like the shame of Sweden and things like that. And obviously this is their first ever Champions League campaign, Beckwack, and so for it to end off the two legs against the Faroese team, I, I do agree it is a bit of an embarrassment. I think 
basically what's happened is Steve, they, they've they've gambled and it's backfired. They've gambled their Champions League money, cashed it in early on Benny Traore, sold him to Sheffield United, and and essentially that's that's cost them in my opinion because his loss has massively sort of just destabilised their front line. Mentioned it a couple of weeks ago as well when they lost to Varnamo. Like I've I've said before that that they they are a bit destabilised at the moment. That they, they're still struggling to get that fluidity. They're looking for a new striker. They've essentially cashed in, made that sort of four or five million pounds, Steve, and that that's the money that would have got them in the Champions League if he'd stayed. So that's the, always the trade-off, isn't it? You do you keep your best players, or do you just cash in and hope for the best? And ultimately, I think that's probably where it's fallen down for them. Defensively, they have been a little bit weaker. I think I saw one of the goals was a bit that was a mistake from the goalkeeper, wasn't it? A free kick that just has basically just trickled through his 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 his, his, his fingers. Um, I think he came out and held, held his hands up here to Abrahamson. It's a real shame for Hack, and I, I mean, I do have a massive soft, soft spot for them. I, I would have loved nothing more than to see them in the Champions League, like group stages. That would have been, I think, a dream come true to be honest for the club. Um, and at, if you look at the table, this, you know they've had a good result this weekend against Elsborough. But are they gonna? When will it, when will we next see them in Champions League action? I mean, I don't know in terms of coefficients how it's gonna affect things. Steve, is it gonna re- maybe reduce the places on offer? I don't know, but. Um, if you widen out the debate, of course, like you said, with with Kalmar, it's all up in the air with them, with with your garden, uh, and of course we're going to come on to Hammer B twenty in a minute. But um, yeah, it's not a great result. But let's move on to Norway. Um, just before, just before we we, we move on, um, I've got to make the point: they're not out of Europe, heck, and they'd stay in Europe. Um, they yeah, now go, they now go into a Europa League playoff uh, two legged tie against uh, Zalgiris, who beat Malmo last year. I actually think they've they've drawn a, a a decent draw here. It could have been a lot worse uh, if they were to get through that tie. They would be guaranteed at least a spot in the Conference League groups, which would be not a bad consolation. Um, if they get through, they could end up playing Ajax in the playoff round, which would be uh, obviously something quite interesting. Along those, there's a few other big teams in there as well. Um, where, where before we move on, where what happens to them now? That's a massive blow like domestically in Europe can they recover from that or is this just going to be could we get them completely implode do you, do you think from this point onwards well the thing is I mean obviously domestically it's an interesting talking point as well because you know we'll briefly touch on it now as well and maybe if we talk about it in part two or not but they've just come off the back of a massive 3-1 win against um against Elsborg with 10 men played 10 men for, with more for more than half the match you know, what we're seeing here, Steve, is the good, the bad and the hack in it, ultimately. Um, you know, Elsborg for the first 20 minutes looked like they were going to basically take them apart. Uh, they get a red card, Sadiq, and unbelievably, they come from 10 men. They pay Metti Sogma goes to a 5-3-1. They have 27% possession and they win the game 3-1 um, against the team who were top of the league, Elsborg, of course. An unbelievable game that was. Uh, Hogma with a tactical masterclass, basically, brings off at the, I mean, it's quite a, Quite an obvious thing, but he brings on a defender, um, takes off a forward, packs the mid, packs the back line, and basically said to Elsborg, like, play through us if you think you can, mate, and if you can't, we're going to counter-attack you. <laughs> and, and that's what they did. So, you know, three, four days ago, we're talking about an incredible win here that's basically put them back into the title race. It's, it's, an, it's, it's an unbelievable win against the team that, don't forget, they, they beat Jürgen 4-0 away the previous week, Elsborg. Um, so to beat them with 10 men, obviously, as I say, and, and to actually come from behind to win is... Is a real showing of, of their class, but there's there's no doubt about it, Steve. They're missing they're missing like some players at the moment. They've had a lot of injuries. Some players coming back, like Sana, he's just coming back to fitness. Um, Amor Layuni's fitted in quite well. I think he got another goal tonight. Am I right in saying? Um, he looked quite sharp. He's 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 been a good signing. But there's no doubt in my mind they miss they miss Triore, and um, I think just that lack of firepower up front. Sadiq has his injury problems every now and then, like that. They're not a team that's maybe built for that sort of three games a week, if you get what I mean, and maybe that's come back to Hortonham. So, you know, where they go from here, if they end up in the Europa League and, and, and win the title again, it's a great season. But what I think the one thing I would say to conclude, Steve, is they, they're going to need to, in my opinion, they need, they need to continue this legacy. It can, can't be a one-season wonder. So I, I think now this increases the pressure on them to win the title. I think they need to do that. And they need to, like, there's a lot of critics about them People saying they've got no fans and stuff like that, and and like if they're going to build this Beckwahakan dynasty, I feel like they need to win the league this season. And so, whoever they buy in the, in the next week or so, a couple of weeks before the transfer window closes, they need they need someone to replace Traore, I think, because 
it's clear that they haven't got the balance yet. And um, don't forget, they've lost Lars Alden Larsen as well, who was a great player for them, who's gone to you know, a mid-table team in the Netherlands. So um, they have their forward line has been depleted. Um, but yeah, I, my conclusion from this is they need they, they can't be a one season one hack and they can't just like lose the title, go to the conference league, get knocked out easily, and then sort of like just crumble away and fade. They have to take advantage of this little like season that you know this few years they're having. I really hope Hogmore stays and um, rebuilds. But of course they've still got European action to come, so we can't write them off yet. But they they are well in the title race now after that win on the weekend. I think we're really going to see just how how big their bollocks are, Jonathan. I really do um, in the next few weeks because this sort of result, if they if they had gone through and then lost against Mordor over two legs, no one's going to bat an eyelid. They probably would have been the underdogs, things like that. But there's so much hype around this result tonight in Europe. It's not just we're not we're not the only ones talking about it. It's everywhere. This Faroese team, the first ever Faroese team to make the Conference League group stage, and Hecken the team on, on, on the back end of it. Ferran Javaros, they're let off the hook now, aren't they? They were the embarrassment of the previous round. And now it's it, it's Hecken. So I think it's going to really be interesting to see how they come back mentally. I actually think they could completely implode. I've seen this before in football. Uh, I will not be surprised if they have a really poor run of results in, in the next few uh, weeks. But as I say, we'll see. We'll see what they make yeah, I mean, the made of, John. The one thing I'd agree with there is they, they are they are like this is a bit of an embarrassment, do you know what I mean? Like this is a bit of a knock to their kind of you know, sometimes when you're a new team just becoming a good team, this is like a bit of a Yeah. The first not, time it's they've lost really? to Fan Faros, I don't think anyone would have even cared. No. But I think the fact that they're losing to like a Faro team, it's like it's like it's like it's like people can hammer them and say you're a small you're still a small club, do you know what I mean, type thing. And that I think that's a stick they're gonna get beaten with. And that's what I mean, they're gonna need a reaction. Um and for us obviously as a podcast, it's, it's gutting not to have Hack and Molder. That would have been you know that would have been a, such a good tie. Like, I would have loved that. So let, let's look at Mulder, Steve. Of course, the, they're your league. Um, they've managed to do their end of the bargain. What exactly has happened in that in that two legs? They nearly didn't. Um, they were 16 minutes away from getting knocked out. Um, they they beat HJK Helsinki 2-1 over two legs. Um, I was really really disappointed in them. Like I said in that first on the last episode, I think did we talk about them? Um, not entirely sure, but um, yeah, they were really poor tonight. I think they eventually managed to break down a, re- a very resolute side, HJK Helsinki. Uh, quite tough to break down. Um, they've got this massive goalkeeper called uh, Jesse Ost who caught my eye in the first leg. I'm not saying he's a good keeper, but he's he's massive, like he just do, do you know, some keepers. Peter Schmeichel used to be a bit like this. You would just look at him and you think, how the hell am I going to score a goal past this monstrous beast? And this uh, Ost goalkeeper um, reminded me of that. And eventually they managed to um, to break them down, get the goal. Christian Eriksen scored 74th minute. And I think at that stage, HJK kind of paid for having such a negative game plan. One thing I didn't say about the KI game, KI actually went to Hecken with the intention to score goals. They didn't sit back or anything. They gave themselves a lot of options on the counter attack, looking to to, to hit Hecken on the break. HJK didn't give themselves that option. They were playing solely for a nil nil draw, very negative football. And once you then concede the goal, I think it can be really hard to suddenly think, hold on a minute, we've got to try and stay in the, we've got to try and win the tie in some fashion or or whatever. And the last fifteen minutes, it was just a matter of time really before Mulder would get the second goal. They did get it. Late on, uh, barrage of pressure. Ola Bryn Hilton managed to convert 89th minute, and they deserved it. Mulder over, over uh, tonight over the two legs, but again, it was a bit worrying um, for for quite a long period. And they've done this before in Europe. They ha- they do struggle to break down teams, especially defensive teams. Um, and you know they're going to have a similar test against Ki because I think Ki will be quite physical in that respect. Um, but they've done the job against the, the the Finnish champions, who I think the HJK missed a little bit of a trick over the two legs. If they've been a bit more enterprising, a bit more aggressive, um, they might have uh, Molder might have been there for the taking. Yeah, and uh, an own goal um, from Ost, and then of course as you mentioned, Jesse Ost, and then as you mentioned there, Ola Brynilsson made it two nil. That wrapped up the two one aggregate win. I think Steve. Uh, you're right in saying about the stats. It looks like HJK had, had one shot all game. 
uh, one shot on target and zero shots off target to Molder's 16 shots in total. Um, but I do have a sneaky feeling. I I'm not I I don't I'm not sure about Molder. I don't massively rate them as an attacking force at times, and I do wonder if Klasvik have a chance of actually going through here. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, one thing I will say is that they've had a good dress rehearsal because I think HJK are quite a similar team, really. Um, certainly in the away leg, we know how Klasvik are going to play. In the, I don't actually know where the first leg's going to be, by the way, yet. Um, maybe I can uh, Google that while we're on uh, air, but. Um, it's going to be quite a tight defensive tussle and I think Mulder might be ready for it this time. But honestly, really, Mulder should, should dim- I don't want to use the word demolish. I was going to use the word demolish, but they should comfortably beat them in the home leg. It just logically should happen. Um, and the difference them for Mulder compared to Hecken, I think Mulder just have a bit more control of the game, they have more control of the ball. Um, they're, they're willing to just have moments of possession where they take the sting out of the game a bit more. I think Hecken are a little bit more, um, not gung-ho, but um, jumpy, if, if you know what I mean. So I think yeah. Mulder are better equipped to deal with KI. But I tell you what, this KI team now have beaten, obviously, the fair, the champions of Hungary and Sweden. So we, we they can't be taken lightly. They do have a chance at this stage. Uh, Mulder though that's a good draw for them compared to who else is left in the competition they couldn't have probably handpicked a better team really so they certainly can't complain and there will be no excuses if they get knocked out by a Faroe East team I'm sorry yeah I think it's probably a good um, way of describing it they are probably a bit more of a controlled side but I don't think they're as dynamic as Hacken that's what would have made this tie so interesting and Mulder Hacken would have been it would have been firepower against sort of like a, you know, Molder a bit more canny. Um, I mean, there's no point speculating now who would have won that. I guess, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to fight another day, Steve. I guess, you know, we, I would have liked to sit here and have a chat about that, but I guess it's no point really, is there? So uh, well done to Classic. Like, listen, there's no sour grapes here. Fantastic achievement. Um, they've killed our Nordic football podcast dream, but at the end of the day, um, Hacken probably will kick themselves and think they have themselves to blame because home leg, yeah, you've got to you've got to wrap it up, haven't you? Let's I move just on. Want to say, got to... Can I just say, I want to, I do actually want to praise HJK Helsinki because I thought this would be a very very easy win for Mulder over two legs. They actually, I didn't like their game plan because it was quite negative, but it was a good game plan how to deal with Mulder. They'd done their homework, they'd done their research, especially in the finish leg. They caught them by surprise a bit, um, and. Do you know what? You're right what you said earlier. I, I do think these other leagues in Scandinavia now, we don't talk about them very often, but Finland, Iceland, Faroes, I think it is getting better. There's no doubt about it. I know the Bride of Lick have got battered by FC Copenhagen, but they scored goals on them. You know, I think there is, um, these other leagues are getting better. So f- fair play to HJK, who now have a trip to Karabakh as a reward for losing this tie. Yeah, and on that note, we have a question from uh, Fexio, Fexione Systems at PHX SYS who says, now that Klax, Vicar, Itrota, Feleg are in Europe, when are you guys going to start covering the Faroese League with a little cheeky kiss emoji? So, yeah, Steve, start brushing up on your um, on your fishermen. Uh, and we did actually we did have a, actually have an interview with the Faroese Manager at the time, Jens Bertolescu, now at Yves Kajotoborg, and as I mentioned, and Steve, I mean, I remember during the pandemic, I did actually watch the Faroese football uh, when there was, remember when there was no football on at all, and the Faroese League was one of the first leagues to come back, a beautiful scenery, it got me into Faroese football for a little bit. I had I enjoyed it. Well, manager save in the Faroe <laughs> Islands, mate. I actually did an advanced database. I did actually take a team into Europe from the. Fe- I actually thought that would only ever happen in Football Manager, but uh, <laughs> it would go into the group stages. Here but it's happened in real life. Later. Um, there are some great accounts that cover um, Iceland and, and Faroe Islands out there, um, and uh, yeah, and the Nordic Footy account as well. By the way, they were going yeah. that when the um, when they won on penalties. So fair, fair play to them. Uh, let's move on, Steve. We've got Europa League action. Yeah, Europa League. We don't know the results of the second leg. Uh, obviously, at the time of recording, but um, it was a good re- week for Buda Glimp. They beat, uh, they won their first leg match 3 0 um, against Bohemians. 
Your garden had a poor round, uh, lost at home to Luzerne 2-1. They need to turn that around in Switzerland. Um, a bit disappointing there. Bran um, have not entered the competition yet. They play on... Uh, they play this Thursday. I forget actually who they're actually got, but they uh, had a buy in the first round. And then um, disappointment for Kalmar at home against Armenian side Punic. But we did say that might be quite a tough tie, although not in the home leg. Um, Hammerby, we thought Hammerby would probably get battered in in, in Holland against FC Twente. Um, but they only lost 1-0. Uh, the scoreline was just a part of this game because there was some unsavoury stuff um, in the crowd as well here. Um, I know you really thought that Hammerby would struggle in this tie, Jonathan. But they, they, they kind of surprise you here, right? Yeah, they surprised me. And I have to say, um, yeah, I mean, we, we obviously, as you know, we have our, our Patreon and we have our sort of weekend previews every now and then and 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 and, 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 and um, predictions and things like that. And our player analysis, don't forget, patreon.com slash Nordic Football Podcast did have a prediction for Hammerby to lose by more than two goals against 20, ended in a 1 0 defeat. And I have to say, obviously, I held my hands up for that, that one. I thought Twente would win pretty comfortably uh, in terms of shots and possession. They were way ahead, should have really wrapped the tie up. But a resilient Hammerby had only conceded one goal and, and they lived to fight another day, uh, which leads me to a bit of a rant, Steve. Now, a rant from, from JF. This is, uh, I know <laughs> this has been brewing up um, this week uh, from you. Uh, so what have you got to say about... Uh... You know what? It's not even really a rant. It's actually more no. of a question, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's an open question. All listeners, followers, I'm happy to sort of uh, hear your thoughts on it. But I just want to ask the listeners, Steve, and you as well. Simple question. Is the Eredivisie actually that good? Now, take away the top three teams, of course, PSV, Feyenoord, and Ajax, who are living in a different world. Never would, I would never knock those teams. They're brilliant teams huge historic clubs who have steeped in history and you know they're on a higher completely different level to the teams that we're talking about here but i have to say steve that 20 game i bet like, i don't know listen i'm not a man who considers himself ignorant i do like to think i know a lot about different leagues around the world uh but i couldn't really recognize almost a single player in that 20 team now that's either a reflection of my just reduced football knowledge these days or maybe european leagues but Apart from the bench, there was a few on the bench that obviously recognised that, that some came on, some didn't. I thought to myself, to this 20 team, they don't, they're not that good. And I thought about it a bit more and I thought about some of the players who have actually gone from Sweden to, to the Eredivisie, Steve. And I started to think to myself, is it actually, I mean, it's probably not a good timing to have this conversation when the champions have just lost to a, a part-time team, really. But but is, is the Dutch league below those big teams that much better than North game? Like level wise, um, what you tell me what you think because we've seen a few players, for example, this past few weeks uh, go to Excelsior as a good example. I think they've signed they signed a player from from a Poikina. They've signed Lars Olle Larsen, I believe, or was it Nijmegen? Um, but anyway, Excelsior have signed two or three players from from Scandinavia. You, you'll be able to tell me maybe um, exact names. But when I'm looking at some of these transfers, I'm starting to think to myself, okay, is it? Don't get me wrong, it is a step up. But is it that much of a step up, Steve? I'm not sure. Second part of my point is, I think, like the other part I have to say, I think it's an absolute disgrace, the behaviour of the 20 fans. Um, and this happened with the AZ Alkmaar West Ham game as well. Um, I don't know what it is, but this element of like attacking just innocent supporters, like not even ultras, but actually attacking families of the players, attacking mixed zones of families and stuff like that, pair, family zone. I think is a complete disgrace. If you saw the videos that leaked on Twitter of the 20 sort of ultras attacking Hammerby fans, they're attacking like women and children and stuff like that. I find it deplorable. Um, and in my opinion, there should be serious sanctions for that because it's, it's all well and good fighting ultras, but to attack like just random members of the public, I think is, is way over the line. Um, but anyway, that just leads me to the wider point, really. I was thinking it, it kind of... This is, there's a lot of beef in this game, Steve, which we'll talk about in a second. This Hammerby 20 game has, has, actually has a lot more beef than I realised. Um, I'll give you a bit of the context to it. So this is why this is going to be a really tasty game, by the way. Hammerby have sold 24,000 tickets already for this match. 
Um, it's going to be a sellout crowd pretty much. It's going to be tasty, Steve, with a wonderful death visit. Now, the backstory to this is the mayor of, of uh, is it twin, is Enshida, I think. I think the city is called Enshida. The mayor of Enshida came out before the first leg. And this is a direct quote, pretty much. He said, Hammerby are not a nice team. They're not nice people. <laughs> what? Um, I don't really, I don't really get why. I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a little bit confused to be honest. Um, I'm just going to get the actual quotes. So basically, what happened is when when Twenty actually arrived in Enchida, when sorry, when Hammerby arrived in Enchida, they were escorted uh, and they were not allowed to certain parts of the city um, because there were concerns that they they are kind of uh, quite a, you know, the Hammerby fans and the ultras and things like that might cause trouble. Now. The mayor, Roloff Blaker, said in the local newspaper, we've realised that Hammerby are not a nice Swedish team. Um, so we've taken precautionary measures, um, which they introduced. So Hammerby fans, they weren't allowed to visit the city centre, Steve, between 10am on the Wednesday and 10am on Friday. I mean, is that a democracy or are we living in sort of like, <laughs> what, what, what's going on here? So they weren't allowed to visit the city centre, like 1,500 travelling fans. Um, this is what the statement said from Deputy Mayor Niels van der Berg. For everyone's safety, the city centre will not be accessible to supporters of the Swedish club to prevent confrontations. This prompted Marty Sifuentes, the comments about saying Hammerby are not a nice club, that prompted comments from Marty Sifuentes. He came out, the manager of Hammerby, obviously. He came out and said, basically, the mayor knows nothing about Hammerby. Um, it's an insult to make those comments. And I don't agree with them at all, basically. And he said, it's sad. Um, I was very surprised to read those statements from the mayor. He may be a good politician, but when it comes to Hammerby, he does not know anything. It's a nice club with nice fans. And I think football's supposed to be a party. And this is something that is should be taken into account, he said. So there was a little bit of bad blood here, Steve, already. Before, obviously, when they came to the match, the fights that took place during the first leg. Now... I just want to read a couple of tweets that we had from uh, Hammerby supporters, Steve, because I didn't quite get this right. When when Mialbi recently, they just announced a new signing. They did a little crossword puzzle. And, you know, obviously crossword, it will tell you the thing and then you have to guess what the, the thing is. You have to guess what the word is. And it said something about no show. And uh, if you read this, we've tweeted it on our Nordic Football account at Nordic Football. It basically... When he's filling out the, uh, the the chief of Malby's, I think the sporting director of Malby's doing the announcement. When he's doing the crossword, he, he writes twenty in it, as if to say that twenty are a no show. And I didn't really quite understand it, but basically they've become like a laughing joke in Sweden, the FC Twenty, about for for not showing up. Um, now, like I said, I didn't quite understand it, so I asked around, and at Wallside ninety two has said, after everything that happened after the game in the Netherlands, the twenty board decided that twenty supporters would not be allowed to come to the return fixture in Stockholm because they consider Hammerby supporters as too dangerous a risk. So they have been called cowards, chickens and no show 20. And that is the pretty much the explanation of the whole story. So what we've got here, Steve, I, I think it's unconfirmed, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be no away fans. Um, but what we have here is a t some serious bad blood between the two teams uh, out of these comments from the mayor. So listen, I'm all for Hammerby winning this game. I think that I think that 20 should win. But I feel like this is the chance to show that Dutch football maybe, you know, are you on that level? Um, I thought that 20 would win this 5-0 first leg. But now I'm seriously thinking to myself, go on, go on, Hammerby. I really, really hope you win this match. And it's rare that I come out Steve like that and say that. But um, after everything that's gone on, I think the comments from the mayor are a bit just cheeky. So I am a Bajan fan for this week's game. Let's see how it goes. Is this like a Kevin Keegan? I would love it if Hammerby <laughs> beats when they win. I would through. love it if they win. I I don't quite know what to say about this. I, one thing I will say though is I watch. We'll talk about this a bit later. But Hammerby played an awful lot better at the weekend um, in the in the Alsvenskan, and I think they've been fired up by this, haven't they? I reckon um, this whole incident has really um, got into them and. You know, fair play. I I completely blame this mayor or deputy mayor of of Enchiday, um to, uh, you know, starting this off because I get fixtures in the past that have constantly had problems like, like PSG Marseille and whatever, or, you know, there's a history and it makes sense to, 
either ban fans from being in a certain area or not have them come at all. But I mean, these these teams have never really never faced each other, have they? Um, I can't think of any issues between Swedish and Dutch supporters before. Maybe there has been. Um, it just seems like a, a, a mayor that stir, stirred the pot. Um, and I agree with Marty Sifuentes' quote there that you know football is you know it's an inclusive sport. We want to you know we don't want to be uh, all friendly friendly, but uh, you know, you've got to give them a chance, right? If, if things go bad, then fair enough. But uh, I think it's really poor. And it's a, it's actually a real shame there's not going to be in any way fans going um, in the second leg. Um, well, there's, there's I conflicting think it... reports. There's conflicting reports. Some some reports are saying there's a thousand fans have already travelled. And of course, you know, people, you can't stop the whole of Enchida from going to anywhere they want. There's different ways to get no. into. No, no, no. There's many ways to get to Stockholm, right? So you can't exactly cap it completely. But. Um, we have to bear in mind here, Steve, as well. Don't forget, like, 100, 100 supporters were arrested. Someone was left hospitalised after this I attack. saw that. That was disgusting. And so this is, like, serious stuff happening here. They're, they're attacking mm. people who are just not, like, delegates, people who are just, like, there to support their family, mm. that kind of thing. It's not it's not like ultras. Um, now, Marty Fuentes has come out in the pre-match for this game and said, I want a Sarajevo-like atmosphere. Um, he is seriously riling up the troops for this one, Steve. He, he's going all in. Um, and basically saying he wants he want I think I've got a feeling Steve, this game has got a bit personal um, between the two clubs, and I think Marty Fuentes is kind of feeling that as well. And he's basically saying um, he wants the team to be seriously up for it. So this this could be a this could be a bit of an upset to be honest. I think this will either go one or two ways. I think either twenty turn up and they just take them apart, and Hammerby lose their head potentially because you know that that when you're too rattled up for a game sometimes. You can lose focus. But if Hammerby can manage the crowd, Steve, I reckon this could be actually a bit of a... This could be potentially an upset here. So, um, Sarajevo atmosphere indeed. We've got a Lithuanian referee in charge, Manfredas Luka Kukas. Um, he's quite experienced, it looks like. Um, but, uh, yeah, things might get a bit tasty. I do I do want to say a couple of things about Dutch football. Um you're right, the top three there are, are pretty good. And yeah, below that, there are question marks. The, the one thing that always strikes me when you watch any Dutch team is they, they only really play one way, right? And it's a lovely way to watch, pretty attack-minded. But like honestly, Jonathan, me and you, I, I reckon we, we'd score goals in the Eredivisie. We'd get chances. Um, It's just the way that they play there. It's so open. And I think Sometimes when things get serious, I mean, let's be honest, AZ got completely tactically outclassed by David Moyes last season um, in the Conference League semi-finals. Now, Moyes is a good tactically astute manager, but it wasn't even close. It was, you know, they, they can't adapt their games. And if teams suddenly make themselves a little bit more rigid or defensive or hard to break down at times, they get frustrated quite easily. And um, that could be a bit of weakness of the whole league in, in total. Um, you know, it's a very good question out there. Tweet us what you think. Let us know what you think about the Dutch league below the big three, because it is, you know, I'm sure it's a very interesting... I mean, you've uh, got the coefficients there. I don't know if they've, they've dipped in, in recent years. I, I, just, I think my general point is, it's not as, you know, teams like Aza Alkmaar in the past. I remember Aza Alkmaar playing, I think it was, I think it might have even been Hacken three or four years ago, and they absolutely destroyed them. I remember Myron Boadu and a couple of others, Coop Miners, had a really good team then. Um, you know, there's one or two really good Dutch sides that are below that level of sort of the, the top three, the big three, but still have good players. I'm just wondering, Steve, if now <coughs> is that still the case? Even with the Netherlands national team, like is that is that still the case these days? I feel like a lot of the best players in the Eredivisie these days are like imports. Do you know what I mean? I mean look the, at last, Jesper, the last two seasons Look at Jesper Carlsen, good. Steve. Look at Jesper Carlsen. He came from Sweden and he's he's AZ's best player by miles now. I think he's going to Napoli. Um, that's just an example I mean, as in these Swedish players come into the Netherlands now and they're like top players, the big players for the league. So that's just my point, really. Coefficient wise, they have been helped in the last two seasons by final making the final of the Conference League 2021 20, 22. And obviously, AZ made the semi finals of the Conference League. Last year, Feyenoord, I think, made the, the quarterfinals of the Europa League. So the last two years of coefficients have actually been pretty good for the Dutch. But before then, 
it was it was fairly fairly poor. So I think really it's just come down to a couple of teams that have just had and fine old are very well coached by Arnie Slot, I must say. Um he's a manager that will go far in the game. So but yeah, below that that mark, then yeah, it's up for debate, isn't it? Um, but it's really go on. Give us a prediction then for the second leg. Are Hammerby gonna? Is this the sort of time that's gonna go like maybe all the weight of penalties again, like tonight? I could see it as I say going one or two ways. I think either twenty will turn up and it'll be sort of two two nil three one away win, or I see Hammerby seriously turning up for this. This is probably their biggest game. Like the way it's been built up, I've not seen a Hammerby game build up like this for years. I feel like that's going to rally the crowd. They're a good crowd when they're on it. 24,000. There's no away fans. Apparently, the tickets have been withdrawn. So, just going to depend who can sneak into the match, obviously. I feel like the whole atmosphere has kind of rallied almost the whole of Sweden round Hammerby with the, you know, that Miabi tweet, for example. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with them, but they're still like, talking about it. So, I feel like there's some solidarity towards Hammerby for this game in terms of just how the people were treated when they went to 20. I think there could be red cards in this game, Steve. I, mean, I think this is going to be a fiery one, generally. Uh, my prediction is going to be. I'm going to go 2-1, 2-1 Hammerby. And I'm hoping we're going to see maybe penalties, but but uh, <laughs> it, it could, could, they did play well against Norshaban, I thought. It could easily go the other way, but Stephen, we, you know what motivation is like in football. I, I think the one thing I can say for sure is Hammerby are going to be up. I didn't think Hammerby would turn up for this tie in general, but they're going to be well up for this game. They're going to be super up for it. I feel like this incident could almost turn around their season. Because it's it's galvanised them in, into action. Yeah, it could. It really, it really has. could. And they sort of needed this, you know what I mean? They just they sort of sometimes get just drift, Hammerby. Yeah, I feel like this has really sharpened the focus. Like, so we're going to see like a properly motivated Hammerby for the first time ever. And I, let's see how they handle it because they've got a young squad. You know, let's see how they handle that pressure. But they've done well enough in the first leg. And if they were to qualify, see that I mean that would change things around in terms of Swedish football. That would at least that would at least be a, a scalp. You know what I mean? Um, because at the moment it's looking pretty bleak, Steve. It's looking like almost every Swedish team could be knocked out. Yeah, uh, I just want to talk. I forgot to mention the Rosenborg result. Rosenborg drew two all the way against uh, Crusaders in Northern Ireland. Uh, they are strong favourites in the in the return leg in Norway. If they do go through, they'll be playing Hearts, uh, Scottish outfit there. Um, do you just briefly? We'll, we'll move. We'll move to the domestic league section soon. But do you give Jorgarten or Kalmar? a chance to turn around their ties away from home? Uh, in a word, no, if I'm being, mm. if I'm being brutally honest. Tough um, places to go, aren't they? I think, yeah, I think well. tough places to go. I think both teams are clearly better than their opponent. Um, you're guarding the only positive maybe is the return of Danielson. He missed the first leg suspended. So I feel like that might boost their defence a little bit and maybe sol- solidify them. I think they've got an outside chance, you're guarding, but I think Kalma, with all the greatest respect to them, I just don't see them turning that game round away from home. But uh, I've seen some sort of the, their fans on Twitter and stuff like getting ready for the game. They're clearly up for it. Like uh, I wish them all the best. I hope Kalmar can pull off an upset. But um, realistically, I think it'll be quite tough for them. Uh, we wish everyone all the best. And uh, next time we, we we talk, hopefully we're discussing still several sides in Europe. Uh, we'll have a break now, and then we'll be talking about some key domestic matters in Norway and Sweden. Um, so catch us uh, for the second half of the episode very soon. Welcome to part two of this episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. My name is Jonathan Vaduba, and of course, as always, I'm joined by Steve Wiss, my esteemed guest and colleague and friend. Steve, there's no other place to start than a massive upset in uh, in Norway. Much to your discontent, I'm guessing, Tromso, giving you a bloody nose again this season, just as uh, Christiansen did in the years past. Um, the team that you say can't do anything this season, just keep rumbling on, Steve. What, what's happened this week? Well, I think the two key results that we need to talk about from the Elite Serien from the past round are a couple of 2 0 away wins. Um, Viking went to their bitter rivals, Bran, um, earlier in the day and won 2 0. And that they're on a great run of seven straight wins in a row. So they moved to within six points of Budaglim to that stage with a game in hand. Uh, and then the late evening kickoff, the Derby of the North, was uh, Budaglim against Tromso. Glimt to beat in Tromso twice this season. 
by a 3-2 margin uh, in the League and Cup. But Tromso got their revenge. They went to Astemira Stadion and won by two goals to nil to maybe throw the title race, and certainly not wide open, but open again. Because if Viking do win their game in hand, they'd only be three points behind Buda Glimt. Uh, and they actually play against each other this coming weekend, which is interesting. So, yeah, two big, two really big away wins for teams against their bitter rivals. That's it was a very good week for Viking and Tromso fans. Let's just say that. Yeah, just put that into context for us because uh, I've seen a lot of fans on Twitter, Tromso fans, are really loving this one. Um, it's a big derby, that isn't it? I mean, we talked about Olorenga and the uh, the issues that went on with Lillestrom and that derby there. Uh, this is still quite a big derby, isn't it, in the north? Yeah, and Tromso keep really surprising me, I've got to be honest with you. Um, part of me almost wanted them to get a battered, battered here, really, just to put them in their place a little bit, because still, I mean, I bang on about this every bloody episode, don't I, the metric side of things, but I think they, I think they actually deserve the win. I've got to be honest, I think they went there and had a very good game plan. They played to their strengths. And you know what? They, they wanted it more. I'm, I'm not saying Buda Glimt didn't want it, but Tromsø, you could just tell every single player on that field, every single player on that bench, all of the staff, it really meant a lot to them. Seriously did. Um, and I, in football, you can't underestimate that sometimes, can you? I think they were... I think Buda Glimp's success in the last few years has really awoken Tromso as a club. And I really don't think they're going to rest until they actually win a trophy themselves of some sort. I think they're, they're well run now. They have, ridden, they have ridden their luck this season, of course, but in a one-off game, they can beat anyone because they've got a great manager who has is a good tactician and he can put a game plan together to beat anyone in 90 minutes. And that's the first time in 33 home league games at Buda Glimp, didn't score a goal. That's a hell of a run. The last team uh, to do that against them was Mulder in 2021, and that was also a 2-0 win. To actually shut out Glimp at home is a remarkable feat domestically. Not very, very few teams can do it anywhere, home or away. So, yeah, crazy outcome, a shock result, and it has maybe made the elite Serian table a little bit more interesting. Yeah, goals from uh, Napoleon Romsai and yeah, he's had a couple Hansen. of weeks. Sorry, yeah, he's had a couple of good weeks. This Napoleon lad, he's been injured for most of the season. They've had a, they've actually had quite a lot of injuries. Trump, so it's worth me saying that. So they're having um, endured quite a lot of issues in that respect. So again, remarkable they've done so well. Really, this manager Gauta Hellstrup is clearly the manager of the season, in my opinion. He extracts, he extracts the very most out of this group of players. And they don't, metrically, I've said before, they, they, do, they don't they do look great, but they play periods of games really well. You know, they game manage excellently. And they are one of the few teams in football you have to actually go beneath the statistics. They're a very unique case, you know. Not many teams are like this, Um but you've really got to delve beneath the surface to um, understand why they're doing so well. Yeah, and on the subject of Glimpty, we've got I've got a question here from me, not a listener, me, mm. um, because we've got some transfer news that's just come in. Of course, uh, Elias Hagen is returning to Norway. He joined, of course, from Buda Glimpt, I believe, uh, and joined EFK Jotterborg. It's clearly not worked out. He's been allowed to leave and he's now moved back to Norway. I think he's joined Wallerenga, am I right in saying? Um, I've got a bit of a theory here, Steve, that Glimp players don't seem to necessarily succeed on their travels, do they? There's been a few cases now. Patrick Berg, I think, was another one. Uh, Bjorkan is one. Doesn't seem to have worked out for Elias Hagen. Do you have any theories as to why, Steve? And what, what, you know, is there an argument to be made that maybe the Buddha Glimp style is so unique in terms of what Kitz and Knutson and co bring to that club that it's hard for those players to then move anywhere else and actually improve themselves. Um, what are your thoughts on that, just in terms of the style and just, just where Glimt are at the moment as a club? Because, you know, that that that's a big derby defeat. Uh, I'm just interested to hear a little bit more in your theories on that and what's sort of going on at Glimt at the moment. Well, I, in a way, 
in hindsight, maybe this defeat was was coming because in the last few weeks they haven't looked amazing. I think they've got got away with a few things. Yes, they beat Sanderfield five two, but they they trailed in that match. They've they've only played in periods of certain periods of games. It feels like I think they've got a bit bored. I just sense they've been a bit bored recently. Um, <laughs> if that's even possible to say. Um, at times, I feel feel like they've almost just tried to do the bare minimum in matches. Whether that's because they want to save themselves for the whole season, I'm not sure. I think this result could be the kick up the arse that they need a little bit because, um, you know, they need to refocus. They they lost a couple of players as well, of course. Hugo Vettelson and uh, Joel and Vuka in the transfer market. And the Norwegian window is only open on August the 1st. So they, no teams have been able to replace their players yet that they sold in July. Um, and I think that is, you know, they've obviously brought in um, Tobias Gullikson now from Godset. That will be a nice uh, addition for them uh, to come in. Um, on the subject of transfer, transfers, there was a ridiculous situation in this Tromso blimp game where I think it was the, the 83rd minute. Tromso, um, there's, there's been a swap deal done last month where Glimt of Signed Daniel Bassi from Tromso, and they they're getting uh, Lassa Nordas in return. I think there's some money involved as well. But anyway, ridiculously, um, Lassa Nordas came on off the Buda Glimp bench to play against the club that now owns him. That he was he's going to join three four days later. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I couldn't believe it when he came on. I actually had to wonder, you know, do I need to go to Spec Savers here? That um, I mean, I hadn't actually noticed he was on the bench, to be fair. But I couldn't believe it. I mean, what motivation would he have had to score against the club that now owns him? I mean, it's ridiculous. But, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, going back to the players that have left Glimt, I think they've done very well with some of their transfer fees that they got. And I think a lot of that was to do with how good they looked in Europe, you know, things like that. But I, I think players like Hugo Vettelson will start to book that trend. Um I think I think two or three of them maybe went a bit too early, like your hawk on AVNs of this world and 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 guys like that, and, and that can happen in football, can't it? Yeah, of course that can happen in football. And in terms of Hagen, he never really quite settled in it. Yeah, of course it's been a bit of a nightmare season for them, really, for different reasons. Um, but it seems like they've made a profit, according to uh, according to Football Scan Allen. Uh, the transfer is about six million Swedish krona. Um, Sorry, that's what he cost them originally, uh, plus a million in bonuses, and he's now moving back to Wallerenga for seven point two million. So they've uh, they made a cheeky little bit of profit there, uh, and they've said that we wish Elias the best of luck in his new club. And obviously, Wallerenga Steve are a bit they're a bit like EFC at the moment, aren't they? Both of them are in sort of pressure situations um, at the moment, sort of struggling teams. Let's move on. And you wanted to talk about uh, I mean, yeah, the well, Viking think- game. Yeah, the yeah well, well done to Tromsø, by the way, before we wrap that up. I think massive congratulations to them. They're doing really well this season. Uh, keep giving Steve that punch in the face because it's I'm loving it. Um, but yeah, Steve, you wanted to sort of touch on Viking. Big win for them. Um, against a brand side who, I'll be honest, I thought Brand would beat them because at home this year, Brand had been excellent. And um, I, those, both those results went well well against what I expected. I thought there'd be two home wins. But Viking, um, there was a lot of excitement now. They're only three, six points off Glimp. They play them at the weekend. If they won that match and then won their game in hand, they would be level on points. Um, I, I, I don't think they will last the pace, but fair play to Viking. I, they, unlike Tromso, they do have better far better metrics to back back them up and they're 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 a legitimately top three top four tied so yeah i think this is a, an unbelievable and, and to beat their rivals brand i think for the fourth time in a row or fifth time in a row now that's a that's a big outcome i think they were quite solid um and then on the break they were catching branner i think salverson should have scored at least a couple of goals in this match and there's a lot saying out there branner running out of steam and I think that I think it's a fair assessment. They they really need this transfer window to get some more bodies in. They're massively lacking depth. Basically, what's happening to Bran is what I expected would happen to them. Perhaps not yet. Um, I did say 
pre-season that they, they they do have to make a few changes if they want to you know maintain a, a medal push or even a top six finish so I think August will do brand brand well um because they just they do look yeah I, I hate to use I don't like to use this word too often but yeah they, they have run out of steam a little bit it's all going to be a stale at brand so let's um yeah let's move on and well done to Viking obviously they, they've gone on the radar a little mm. bit but they are second in the league uh, Tromso third, of course, and Mulder currently fourth. I mean, we glimpsed, we just talked about them briefly. Of course, don't forget they have got that tie against Bohemians, um, but they're fairly comfortable in that one, 3 0 up. So, you know, let's see how they get on. And of course, we've got Rosenberg against Crusaders. Um, I think you wanted to talk about Olorengo at the bottom there. I mean, we just talked about their new signing, Hagen. They're, they're literally second bottom at the moment. 11 points from 15 games. I mean, they've changed managers. All sorts has been going on in this club at the moment. I mean, wh- where are we at the moment in your assessment of them after this last round of results? Shocked. It's another result that completely shocked me. Volarenga losing at home to Sanderfjord. This is a big day for Volarenga. They were celebrating 110 years of, of their existence. They, I think the, the, the gates were open from like 10 or 11 a.m. Big crowd, lots of events, concert on afterwards. And, you know, they, they can't ask for an easier match. Sanderfield at home. Sanderfield are a terrible team, certainly defensively. Um, I and, and they still weren't very good defensively in this match. But Volarenga are starting to get to the stage now. They're second bottom, 11 points from 15 games. There was a good question asked in uh, on, on Twitter from, I think it was Big Sig. Yeah, Big Sig 5, again, with a good question here. With the relegation battle as tight as it is in both leagues, which teams seem least prepared for the fight to stay up? And I think Big Sig is insinuating that maybe there's some... Uh, maybe Volarenga are not very well equipped um, for this relegation battle. And maybe th- that would be a fair point to make because they're not a side expected to be in this relegation fights we i mean i had them i think fifth or sixth pre-season most certainly had them in the top half for predictions we've seen some big teams get relegated from elite Serien in recent years the likes of viking brand lillestrom and i'm starting to think hold on could we be in for another big shock because that is not good enough you it was a must-win game and they lost at home to sanderfield so they've really got to pick themselves up um because you're not too good to go well, we've talked about Rosenborg a few weeks ago getting potentially relegated. In a sentence, can do you think Warrenga will, will go down? I don't think they will because I think the likes of your Arlesons, your Sanderfjords, Hamcam, Starbeck, they're probably surrounded by some fairly poor teams there. And I think it was a similar answer to what I gave to where you were asking about Rosenborg a few weeks ago. But if they're not careful, <laughs> I mean... Yeah, I had. I think everyone had them down for not just beating Sanderfield, but putting on a statement win, comfortable success that they're back on track. So they can't afford too many uh, more results like that. So I think they'll be all right. But I'm starting to think, hmm, for the first time, I'm like, this could happen. And how's their new manager settling in after all the chaos controversy? He hasn't picked up a point yet. I mean, <laughs> so much for this, you know, managerial switch. Um, yeah, they certainly played better the last two games, but they keep making a lot of catastrophic errors, individual mistakes, all the hallmarks of a team that's under pressure. You know, it often happens when you're down there at the bottom of the table, you can't play, uh, I don't, not with freedom, but there's so much like, the, it feels like the noose is so tight around your neck that there's not much wriggle room for players. Um, it's going to be a big August for them. They're probably going to have to get um, guys in, Elias Hagen, it is an area they needed to reinforce. That's a good start. Um, but it is very, very worrying times for Volarenga. This would be an unbelievable relegation if it happened. Um, it would be a huge shock. And uh, and amongst it all, a massive three points for Sandyfield, who honestly looked to me like they were... I weren't sure they were going to win again this season, the way they were playing. It's like, seriously. They, um, from a defensive perspective, they've been a disgrace of late and they still are really um but fair play it's a good three points for sandyfield and um at the moment they would be in the playoff again yeah and the crazy thing is that uh lillistrom got a nice solid uh 3-1 win against ham cam Asen dragsness and a Skogvold penalty so things are going pretty well for them there despite all the chaos 
Um, Steve, let's let's move on. We're going to talk about relegation in Norway now. I think before we wrap up the show, unless there was any other th- any other points of business he had in, in relegation. Norway. I think we're going to move on now to uh, to Sweden. Um, and just before we talk about the the relegation battle in Sweden, there is a question that I'm going to ask you, and it is from um, someone who contacted me on Twitter called Luke Tracy or oh, Tracy. Sorry, um, he said. Um, that he is now fourth in the Alsvenskan uh, Fantasy NFP League. Uh, so he feels a bit more confident now asking some questions about uh, Sweden again. Um, fair play if you're doing that well in, 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 in any fantasy uh, league. I think he's asking mo- me and perhaps you as well here. Are you still confident in your Malmo prediction or can surprise package elsewhere keep the run going uh, or could hack and defend? The title from this stage on. Um, I think part in answer to me, I think I actually said on the pre season show I thought Malmo would win the league by 10 points or more. Um, no, I, was, I don't think that now, but I still think, um, that they, they they may well win the gold medal. I don't know how you're feeling. I think it's, I think it's massively up for grabs. I mean, great question. Um, probably the worst time to ask it because it's literally. One point separating all three teams. Obviously, game in hand, uh, Malmo and Elfsborg have over Hacken. But I think, I think at this point in time, right now, Steve speaking, right now, you could flip a coin. Um, Malmo is still integrating their new signings. Not massively convinced, based compared to like earlier in the season where they were just cruising it. Still think the loss of Larsen and um, Christiansen is 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 sort of they've just been a little bit destabilized. It's the same thing with with Hacken, destabilized with the loss of Benny Traore. Um, how are Elfsborg going to react to that three-one defeat? Are they can they can they handle the favourites tag? Listen, I, you know, I know I've got a bit of a reputation for sitting on the fence on these shows at times, but uh, unfortunately, this one's I'm going to be sitting on the fence with some popcorn because it's going to be very very exciting title race. I think um, it's not one I can call right now. If you had to give me like, if I had to give you an inkling, uh, as of now, I'm leaning towards Elfsborg winning it. But there's 13 games to go, and I'm I'm a little bit concerned about what I saw in that hacking game, the way they the way they melted, because that was a melt, to be honest. Um, so I really genuinely can't can't answer that at the moment. Like I'm too I'm too conflicted. So um, let's watch this space. But I would I would just edge Elsborg just because of the lack of like turbulence. But then again, Andre Roma's leaving, um, so phew, he's a key midfield player. So phew, they, yeah, the transfer window is going to decide a lot. I think whoever whoever gets the the last few deals done, that could be the key to the title race, in my opinion, because all of them are sort of losing key players at key times. I actually watched a bit of Malmo Varnamo on Monday, and it was a tremendous game, probably the best watch of a Malmo fixture I've had all season. For the first time this year, I felt there was an element of franticness and desperation about Malmo, actually. Normally, they're quite controlled and composed and a little bit passive under um, this manager. But they were they were taking a lot more risks against Varnamo. And um I do wonder if you know that is a sign of their mental state that they are also feeling the pressure. Yes, they won the game. But I think all these teams are feeling the heat a bit right now. Yeah, um, they're not they're not as controlled without Larson and Christians. There's no doubt about that. That mm. that, that that Henry I bet Henry Reese was not happy right now. The Reese from style of play is it's kind of like there's a bit of a splutter in the wheel. Definitely. You can see that they're not as controlled, a bit more frantic. They're a bit more rushed, which I don't think he would want as a heavy possession-based manager. Um, I have to mention that again, just emphasise that Steve. Andrew Roma leaving Elsborg is a massive blow. He's gone to Mitchelland in Denmark. He actually left the field in the first half injured when Hacken, when Elsborg were 1-0 up. Sorry. Um, and it almost epitomised the collapse from there. Like he, he left the field, the bench at Elsborg looked really concerned. You know, everyone looked like you looked like he was close to tears. Obviously, last game, then they just go and throw it away. Like, is that going to be psychologically in the back of their minds? Because he, he he's like he is like a midfield maestro for them. Um, and I'm just wondering psychologically, could that affect them? Because the minute he went off the pitch, they did not look the same team. So, honestly, it's going to be all I can say is it's going to be a really fascinating title race. Because I think if Hacken had lost that game, they'd be out of it. But they, the fact that they've won. To me, puts them back in it, but I, I'm still not convinced by them in terms of the reasons we've just dis- dis- discussed in part one. So, um, yeah, all three teams are still in it, and uh, it's going to be 
with you know 12 13 games left it's going to be very very interesting i i talked about varnamo there who by the way really impressed me actually on monday night i think they're a real devil of a side to face um but they are very much in this relegation battle now because the bottom of the table there's some weird shit going on in our svenskan john i can't really make head or tail of it we've got the likes of Degafors um kept a clean sheet for the first time this season um at the weekend i mean their defense is an absolute shambles for most of this, the year and suddenly they they win to nil ef core yotterborg got themselves a win you actually predicted this um in a message to me about five minutes before kickoff you actually said ef core gonna win today mate and you're absolutely right. They beat Kamar 2-0. Um, long time coming. Uh, good, solid win. Varberg, <laughs> after the absolute disgrace that we labelled them in the previous episode, I mean, someone must have been listening to the Nordic Football Podcast, I reckon, because they went to, to Helmstad and won 5-0. I mean, what, what the hell is going on here? And then also, I caught uh, beat Sirius uh, really a uh, late goal, a huge win for them. Sirius um, are in some trouble, as you said on the, on the last episode. I mean, this this is really an intriguing relegation battle now, Jonathan. It's very topsy turvy, very hard to predict. Yeah, it's going to be a great end to the season. I think. I think there's a lot of storylines to play out here. I don't think anyone, um, just looking at the table, I don't think anyone is safe from Miaobi down. So from ninth to bottom, I think no one's safe. I think Miaobi, I think Miaobi and Bromwell Pokemon are maybe just about safe, but I don't think they're necessarily safe. Only five points above the relegation playoff. Um, Hamstad only three points above that. So if you, any any other team from there down, I don't think they can say they're out of it. I mean, Varnamo, like you said, I, I, they really impressed me the way they play football. Um, that, you know, the manager there is just a fantastic manager. We had his, we had the assistant manager on, obviously, last season, David Cellini. So you can go back and listen to that if you want to get an insight into Varnamo, how they run. Um, AIK starting to climb out of it now, of course, with that win. That was a massive win, by the way. Let another late goal, Steve, that Sirius conceded. That I mentioned it the week before. Sirius, they play some nice stuff, but when it comes to the crunch, you know, they're like Tony the Tiger, Steve, and, and, and they crumble. Um, so that's what they did, basically. Last, last minute goal from Bilal Hussein. Another defeat for them. I can I can genuinely think of about eight points that Sirius should have picked up that they've lost in like, like late in game, Steve, minimum. Um, is that going to come back to haunt them because they're now 13th, they're only level on points with Degafors. Even Degafors have started to look a little, you know, slightly better, maybe not great, but marginal improvements. And then, of course, you've got EF Core, new signings have come in. They've, they've sort of steadied the ship a little bit. Santos, McCauley, um, they're looking a little bit better. I just felt that they were all going to beat that beat Kalmar in that game. I just saw that one coming. Kalmar midweek, obviously a European game. You're not used to that. And then the Varberg game. I mean, that's that's a derby as well, by the way. Absolutely destroyed Hampstead away from home in a derby. 5-0. Uh, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw the result of that. In fact, you texted me saying, what's going on there? And I would completely forgotten the game even took place. Um, that sums it up, really. Like, uh, an incredible win. They've only scored 16 goals all season and they got five of them in that one game away from home. Um, huge win for Varberg and I think I still think they'll probably go down but that's given that's got to give them confidence hasn't it for the next few weeks and let's see where they go from there and, and actually Steve now you look at it in hindsight that was a big win for EF Core Yotterbo because if they hadn't won that they'd have, been, they'd have been bottom of the table and I think psychologically that's not a place to be in there would have been seven points behind Degafors if they hadn't have won that match so um, if they'd lost that match obviously so you know, that was a really big result. It sort, of, it sort of put them within touching distance of the likes of Degafors, AIK, Sirius. So, um, yeah, plenty of plenty of drama going on. Yeah, I have to say, the um, the I, AI, AIK match, it looked like it was heading towards 0-0. They, they got that late goal. There was an unbelievable late save from Nortfeld. That's two weeks in a row. I think he's been brilliant for, for AIK. Um, oh, that was unbelievable, that save. I'm looking towards him to solve my goalkeeper crisis problems in our Svenskan fantasy because every goalkeeper I pick is literally cursed um, this season. And the most recent one, <laughs> I've brought him in for a week and he's retired from football. <laughs> my, my history, I've had Friedrich in my team a few times. Um, God knows how many injuries. But um, Nielsen Safkrist 
Um, <laughs> we, have to, we can't, we can't I'm laugh. Not, I'm not I'm laughing, laughing at you. I'm laughing at you, not the situation. I know, but... I know. I'm not laughing at the situation, but it is yeah. kind of, I am the curse of goalkeepers. Um, you can't make it. Min- I mean, he's, 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 I he's mean basically... this is a shock retirement, isn't it? Well, I don't know exactly what's going on, but he put out a statement on Twitter today and it's sort of come out that he's basically going to take a break from football. I don't actually know what happened in this game, Steve, so I need to kind of go back and look at it. I didn't see the match. He went off after sort of 20 or so minutes. Don't know if it was injured or if it was like literally just a tactical change that maybe has made him reflect on his career. But he's come out and basically said he needs a, he needs a mental health break from football. Um, Hampstead have signed a new keeper. They've signed uh, um, the former Malmo goalkeeper. I think it's um, Marcus... Johansson, I'd have to double check that, but um, yeah, so really sad news, obviously, from for Malcolm Safers. I've like I say, I have to be honest, I don't know exactly what's gone on. Yeah, Marco Johansson, he, he's come in, but um, yeah, re- really a big shame in my opinion because uh, Hamster have been having a good season to be fair, and um, I mean, yeah, it's quite funny for your fantasy team. I mean, I think we've all been there with uh, bringing in players in who suddenly you know, get red cards, get injured, retire from the game out of nowhere. So, uh, yeah, we've all been there, I guess. But um, obviously, we Nordic Football Podcast, we wish him well. We, we certainly do wish him well. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, a real, real shame, uh, like you said. And uh, I'll have to move my goalkeeper curse on to someone else. Maybe Norfolk, I don't know. He's quite expensive in the game. But, uh, um where else are we? Is there anything else you want to talk about in Arsvenska before we sign off the show? I think that's it for us this week. That is done. All done and dusted. We look forward to these Europa Conference League games. We look forward to a weekend of action in, in Norway and Sweden. Things I really do feel like things are, are hotting up both in domestically and in, in these European qualifying games. It's that time of year, isn't it? Where I, I really think there's a lot of excitement. Jonathan, it's uh, it's tasty times. Yeah, we do actually have a live on a question. I can't even actually read his bio out because it's slightly. Uh, I feel like I'm <laughs> going to get in trouble if I read it out. But Jack Hacken has said, with both the Osvenska, we'll end it on this one. With both the Osvenska and Elita in over the last few years improving in large amounts in terms of quality, do you think talented players from the leagues will in the future be able to more often forfeit a middle step and go directly to the Prem and other big leagues? With middle step, I refer to the likes of Belgian Pro League or Dutch Eredivisie. So there you go, Steve. That's that's very topical to our conversation. Of yeah, the Dutch I do. Um, what's your thoughts? I, I think we're starting to see it, aren't we? Look at Benny Traore. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because um, talent scouting is obviously increasing. They've seen that these players that come, you know, go to the middle grounds can then cost an absolute fortune. So clubs are not stupid. They would much rather pay a lower fee originally. And it's a lot, unfortunately, some will get caught in what I call a Chelsea model where you get loaned out a lot. Um, But yeah, clubs aren't stupid. And uh, I think Belgium's had it a bit too good for too long, hasn't it, really? Um, But they may well be uh, usurped by some bigger leagues and bigger clubs. What What do you think? Yeah, I think it touches on my point about the era de Vizzi. Like that, that was kind of my point I'm getting at. Is it actually that good a league anymore compared to Sweden? Is it, is it really necessarily... Um, do you need to make that step in a way? And like, don't get me wrong. If a team from... If Ajax or Fajan or someone comes in for a team and play in Osvenskan, I've got no qualms about them. That's a massive step up. But when it's like NEC Nijmegen or, I don't know, some of these other clubs, like I don't I don't know the finances behind the, the, two, the two leagues, but I can't imagine they're massively... Like, I can't imagine... An AIK or your garden player, for example, is getting much more than, much less sorry than a than a than a Excelsior player maybe or an NEC Nijmegen player. I, I don't that I have to admit my ignorance on the budgets there, but yeah, I think that I definitely think that can happen. I think I think the test case, Steve, will be Benny Traore. I genuinely think that um, it'll be really interesting to see how he gets on in the Premier League because is he going to be just loaned out and given time to adapt, or will he go st- sort of straight into the Premier League squad? I'm not quite sure he's actually Premier League ready yet, if I'm being honest. Um, so maybe there's a middle ground somewhere, like maybe Liga, somewhere like that could be could be the next step for the, some of these players. But uh, yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, and at the end of the day, Steve, you mentioned talent scouting. The, the bottom line of it is, as well is that level of scouting, you can loan your players out anyway, as you've just mentioned. You know, you, you can sign them for peanuts from 
Sweden mm. and loan them out to a Belgian club instead of sort of waiting and paying 20 million. So I do see that happening. I think that the talent is, is better now. I think there's more players that are ready for sort of bigger steps. Um, it doesn't surprise me to see the likes of Jesper Carlsen going to the Netherlands and becoming one of the best players in the league. So, I mean, I know there's been some failures, you know, um, I could think of not failures, but Dalho Erendus, for example, went to Groningen and hasn't done a huge amount. I know there's some Swedish players who've gone to the Netherlands and not necessarily been great. Um, but for example, I think Amin Saar, he did really well, didn't he? Here went, got a move to Lyon. Um, so there's definitely great examples of that. And um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if we see more Benny Traore's sort of direct to Premier League moves or direct to top division moves like Hugo Larsson to Eintracht Frankfurt. That would not surprise me in the future. Well, I'll finish the episode by giving you an example of a success story. It's been a frustrating podcast for me, this one, but I'm going to finish on a real high here because I was doing some of my spreadsheets um, in the French League today and I was doing Stade de Reims and I was delighted to see uh, a new signing that they have. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't, for some reason, I hadn't noticed this. It happened two or three weeks ago. But the big Kenyan, Joseph Akumu, is now in Liga. Is he? 12, 12 million euros they paid for him from Ghent, <laughs> Stade de Reims. So he is with Will Still, a fantastic up and coming English coach. Um, and it will be interesting to see his game develop. 26 year old, 1.9 meters tall. That was the first thing. <laughs> Um, stood out to me um, when, when I saw this, but I was delighted to see him move to Liga and I'll be watching plenty of him this season, but he is one of the big success stories um, of moving to those middle grounds and then, well, he's stood the Rams a, a step up from Ghent. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but uh, he certainly cost him a fair whack. The big Kenyan, yeah. What a, what a player. We talked about him many times on this podcast and, uh, yeah, I guess maybe it's... Um... Yeah, it's, 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 it's not looking so orange for the orange, I guess, ever in, ever in the Netherlands these days, maybe. But um, yeah, that'll wrap it up, I think. Um, yeah. Terrible night for Swedish teams, really, at the end of the day. It's hacking. Um, but yeah, plenty of action going on. And thanks a lot for your listener questions. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter at Nordic Footpod. You can find us on patreon.com slash Nordic Football Podcast as well. Um, if you want to support us, of course, we really appreciate any support and subscribers. And, of course, we have the bonus episodes. Don't forget the Acor Adams one, the most recent one released. And, of course, uh, regular tips as well and predictions. So that'll be all from me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or, as it's called now, X, I guess, at JF Football. Uh, what about yourself, Steve? You can find me on X, at Mean Man Soccer. <laughs> it's still Twitter, isn't it? But uh, anyway, um, yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed that uh, show an unusual midweek uh, episode from the Nordic Football Podcast. But until next time, it's goodbye from me. See you around. Goodbye.